All right, we're going to get started here. By the way, if you still would like to get one of the journals of the book of Philippians, you can grab those at the, um, uh, the uh, um, information booth. There you go. It went out of my head as soon as I said it. And then um, they're $5, and, um, but all they are, very basic. It's literally scripture on one side, blank pages, so you can take notes as you go through. For those of you that have the app, the YouVersion Bible app, I want you to know that all the verses are already preloaded for you, uh, and all you have to do is go to there, go to events, find Cedars, everything's already preloaded for you as we jump into this book. Okay, my confession. I did not lie to you. I told you you needed to come back to ch for chapter two. I did not tell you that we were doing chapter two this week. I didn't. I didn't. I said you need to come back for chapter two. We're finishing up chapter one today. <laughs> Uh, so, by the way, chapter 2 starts next week. So, for those of you that came back just for chapter 2, see you next week. All right. So, uh, very, very good. Hey, I uh, want you to know uh, that uh, my hope is, is you're going to get a lot out of today's message, but it is heavy. Let me just say this before. I, I don't usually give primers. I usually just jump in. The second part of chapter 1 is us seeing a depth of maturity, of Christian maturity of christian faith that honestly me as your pastor am still trying to achieve we're going to be seeing it we're going to see the bar that is set and then each one of us need to realize not with guilt but with a sense of like wow this is where i need to be shooting for now our ultimate shooting is christ likeness but we're going to be seeing what paul says in these passages it is heavy and so i just want you to know that that again i'm not coming to you like oh man i got this whooped and this should be you i am telling you this is something we should be seeing all right let's jump in this is philippians chapter 1 verse 18 this is where we ended last week paul had just gotten done explaining about his time in prison and he ends with this what then only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. And so what he's saying is this. doesn't matter whether or not people are preaching Jesus for this reason or this reason. If Jesus is preached, I'm good. He's not getting into the pettiness of it. He's not getting into all this, oh, they're trying to hurt me. Or they're trying... Nope. If Jesus is preached, I'm going to rejoice. Now, I shared with you last week that verse 19 actually should start right there where that asterisk is. The number is actually misplaced. Um, because, again, it starts a new sentence. And then verse 19 says, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. What he's saying is, I'm in prison. I don't want to be here, although God is using me and God is glorified through this. He's reached out to the Roman guard. He's converting people left and right. God is using the situation. He believes that him being here is going to come out for his deliverance from the situation. And he uses this phrase that he says, I know. I know. And through your prayers, he believes that their prayers for him to be released, their, their prayers for him that he would not be stuck here, that through those, this will turn out for my deliverance. And he's standing on that truth. I know that God has a plan for this. And he believes in the power of prayer. Verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but, but that with sorry, I did this, but that with full with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So let's walk through this. And it is my eager expectation. Okay, so what is he eager, eagerly expecting? It is my eager expectation. And hope that I will not be at all ashamed. This is not him being ashamed of the gospel. This is this. No matter what I face, whether I live or I die, may how I react to it not put shame on Jesus Christ. How I do this, whether I live or I die, may I not put shame on Jesus Christ. I want what I do, how I live, how I handle what comes at me to give glory to his name and in no way bring him shame. And he is eagerly expecting to not bring shame on the name of Jesus Christ. 
But with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. This vessel, Paul, chained to this Roman guard, no matter if I live or if I go before Caesar and he takes me out, may I honor him with how I live. Now watch this. Whether by life or by death. So you need to know, Paul has gotten to a level in his maturity that goes, look, it's not about life or death. That is a subplot. And by the way, that's not true necessarily for us. That could be a big deal for us, whether I live or die. For him, that is, that is way down here. It's about how I live and how I die. That what I do and how I do it honors the name of the one who died for me. That is a maturity level of someone who gets that this life-death thing is not the game. It's how I live and what comes at me. To underline that, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Paul is going to speak to this situation. Verse 16, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it, not, may it not be charged against them. He's like, look, I'm not holding it against them. They were freaked out. He got arrested. They didn't know what to do. But none of them came to his side. But look what he does say. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So that through me, now watch this. You would think it would be so that through me he would help me get through this so I would get out. That's not what he says. So that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was, I was rescued from the lion's mouth. So when he got into the situation, that first meeting, his plea wasn't, hey, how do I get out of here? His plea wasn't, how do I avoid all this? His plea was, God, if you're going to put me in front of these officials, give me the boldness to speak your name. So let's see what happened at the first meeting. This is Acts 26, 28 through 29. And Agrippa said to Paul, because he had just been preaching the gospel. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time... Would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. He got in front of these officials who have control over his life and death and didn't make it about his life or death. He made it about sharing the gospel with these officials. And King Agrippa's like, you, you think you're going to win me over? And he goes, hey, short or long, I'm giving it a shot. I'm giving it a shot. So let's go back to um, 2 Timothy verse 18, which says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. That part's done. He goes, that is checked, done. I know the Lord is going to bring me into his heavenly kingdom. That's not his concern. That's beyond him. But he says, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. But may I glorify him. May I glorify him no matter where he puts me. Whether that's in front of people in the city of Philippi, or whether that's in front of Caesar, or any official along the way, or the guard that's chained to me. Go back to verse 20 of Philippians chapter 1. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Whichever way it goes, may I not embarrass his name. Now, I want to share with you the same heart the apostles had. I want you to see how they handled this idea of being imprisoned or jailed for the name of Jesus. This is Acts 5, 40 through 42. And when they had called, the, called in the apostles, they beat them. And folks, we run over scripture way too quickly. They beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They didn't leave going, oh, they beat us, we're wrong. They didn't, they, oh, they beat us, we, we, we've messed up, they've won. No, they left 
comparing bruises, go, oh, that's a good one. Woohoo! Because here's their heart. Guys, Jesus, let us be beat for his name. Jesus, let us be beat for his name. He counted us worthy enough for his name. And then I love this. They were charged not to speak anymore, but I love verse 42 with all my heart. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching the, the Christ is, that the Christ is Jesus. Do you understand they could beat you again? Yep. Do you understand they could drag you in again? Uh-huh. And it just means that we get to be beaten for his glory again because we're not going to stop telling people how they can be saved from sin and hell. We're not. Because what happens in this earth is temporary and I'm looking for the eternal. And if I focus on the few years I have here as the most paramount of everything, I'm going to miss all of what he has for me in eternity. I'm going to miss it. And then we get the passage. For to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Folks, let me just share this with you. To get to a point where you go, look, if I got a 50-50 choice, like, like for folks, the, the die part, most of us are not in the 50-50 choice place. Like, no, it's pretty much like 80, 20, 90, 10. We want to live. And, and Paul goes, if it comes down to a, a coin flip, look, he goes, look, to live is Christ. Let me tell you what that means. That means that I am his body. That means that I am his feet and I have his hands. I'm his voice. I'm his heart. I get to serve people. I get to love people. I get to talk to them. That's what it means to live as Christ. I get to be his body on this earth. I get to give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. I get to be in places where because of what I've taught people grow and are saved. But he says, but to die is gain. To get to the point that you go, no, death is gain. So he explains it himself. So let's let him do that. Verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. I get to keep doing this. I get to keep serving. I get to keep sharing. I get to keep teaching. I get to keep being around people and loving on them. Yet which shall I choose I cannot tell. I mean, he literally is at this point like, I don't know. Don't give me the option. I don't know which way I'm going to go on this. Watch this. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to part and to be with Christ, for that is far better. Paul goes, look, I get it. Yeah, being here, being with you, great. But if I get to go be with Jesus, that's the better option. Hands down, better option. Why? Because Paul has seen who Jesus really is. And he goes, look, if I get a choice, I'm going home. I'm going home. And this is a place of maturity. That we go, how do we get to a place where if I was given the option, you're like, dude, I, I'll go home. If you give it to me. I mean, if he, if he wants me to stay here and keep laboring, great, but give me a choice, I'll go. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Look what he says. It's not for me. It's not for me. He goes, I don't stay because of me. If I have a choice, I go home. But on your account, I'm going to stay. You need me to teach you more. You need me to walk with you. <clears throat> you need me to inspire you. You're not done. You, you need me to hold your hand, encourage you, applaud for you, cheer for you, whatever you need. But he goes, I'm staying on your account, not mine. That's what he says to the church in Philippi. I'm going to stay confidently. I know this, that God will deliver me for your account. But I'm telling you, if it was up to me, I'm going home. Verse 25, convinced of this. I love this. 
convinced of this. Convinced of this, I know. That's the second time he's used the phrase, I know. The first one is, I know that God will take me out for my deliverance. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. God's not done with me yet. There are things that he wants me to do with you and for you. Therefore, yes, my imprisonment could mean that Caesar could say kill him. By the way, it is believed that Paul is imprisoned a second time, and it is Nero that does have Paul beheaded. But in this first round in prison, he goes, no, I'm going to get out, and I'm going to encourage you. Well, watch this. For your progress and joy. For your joy. I'm going to remain for your joy, Philipp Philippian church. I'm going, to re I'm, going to, I'm going to literally come so that you can have joy and that God is still using me in what he has for you. And again, that's why he anchored this thing on joy. You're going to see joy, rejoice happen all throughout the book of Philippians. Continue for your progress and joy in the faith. Verse 26. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So that in me, this vessel, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. So when I come to you because God released me, came to you, you will glory not in me but in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul, in two scriptures, this one and in Philemon 22, gives reference to the fact that he believes that he is going to leave this imprisonment. By the way, it was a two-year imprisonment. And he's going to be released, and he'll come to the church in Philippi. And then in the book of Philemon, it says, hey, look, set up a place for me in Colossae, because I'm going to be coming there. He believes, he believes, and he goes, I know that I will be delivered from this. But it's going to be, again, to the glory in Christ Jesus. Only. Here we go. So Paul knows he still, has some time, he still has some time in jail. And so in writing back to the people of Philippi, he writes the word only. And that word only is important because what it's saying is this. No matter what happens, because here's what he's saying. Don't wait for me to come to you. Don't start living this out when I get there. He's saying, when you get this letter, I want you to know this. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Church in Philippi, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Cedars Church, let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ how you are at your office, how you are on the job site, how you are in your classroom, how you are with your friends, how you are on the team. Let your life be in the manner of the worthy of the gospel of Christ. How you choose to live, what you do, how the world sees you. He's saying, look, it's not about waiting for me. It's not about this. It's like, no, only right now, as you get this, let your life be worthy of the manner of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. Standing firm. In one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the, faith of the gospel. Get unified, church. Stand side by side. What are you to be doing about the gospel? Get on one page. Don't let things divide you. Standing firm firm in one spirit. Church of Philippi, you're going to need each other. This is how you're going to reach your city. You need to stand and work side by side. This needs to happen. But how you live matters. And people should notice how you live. People should notice the difference that it makes. But when they notice, it's also going to to cost you. 
and we get to verse 28. Now, I want to say to you that um, it is important that I share something with you. See, the thing is, is it really is important that we understand the manner in which we live. And I want you to understand that, that, by the way, what we do is impactful. And I want you to know that I don't want you ever to be ashamed of your actions. So I'm going to share a story with you. My high school, uh, I've, we all know that in high schools that the cliques all group out, right? And you sit in certain sections. You guys remember the sections you sat in and the ones you didn't sit in? You guys remember that? Like you could go to this section, but you can't go to this section. And you go to these people, but you can't go to these people or whatever the case may be. And I know where I was allowed to kind of go. And, and I could pretty much flow free, free through a couple of things. But um, I was really at my high school, middle of the ground, middle of the pack kind of a guy. Now, the church that I attended was a mega church before we knew what mega churches were. We didn't even know to call them mega churches yet. Um, our youth group was about 300 to almost 400 kids at times. And I was an officer and a leader of that youth group. So at my school, I'm down here in this middle section, but at my church, I was at this upper level. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? I was one of the upper level people. I'm going to tell you of a place where I was ashamed of my actions. So I'm at my high school, and, and one of the guys, who, by the way, was at the top of the high school's level, came to me and goes, hey, I hear your youth group is awesome. I hear it's great. Man, I, I've heard good things about it. And I'm like, it's all right. It's okay. It's not, it's not for me. And I changed the subject. Now, he just gave me an opening to share the gospel. Come with me, man. Come. Come and, and do this. My 17-year-old self said, but if, he, if Mike Bogosian comes to my youth group, then he'll come up to the top and dethrone me. And I'm ashamed. My desire to want to be the top dog on my little pond missed an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. See, this is what I want to say. Live in a manner worthy of the gospel. It's not about you. It's not about you being dethroned. It's not about your pillows. And I pray on a constant basis that someone else took another shot at Mike Bogosian to give him a chance at Jesus Christ. Folks, I think what we need to understand is that I'm not here for what this world says is important. We need to be here for his name and for his glory. And for his glory. Folks, I hate to tell you, I wish you there was only one of those stories in my life. I wish. Verse 28. And not be frightened in anything by your opponents. Here we go. In the letter sent to Paul in prison, he hears about these opponents. They have struggle. They have people coming after them. They have people that are, that are coming after who they are. There are people that are in opposition to this church in Philippi. There is an actual group that is there. And folks, I need you to understand something. In America, if you become a Christian, for the most part, because of the fact of where our country has been, your family members, for the most part, are like, ah, oh, it's a phase, or I hope that's good for you, just don't bug me, and at the end of it, it's done. Does that make sense? They'll roll their eyes at Thanksgiving, or whatever they're going to do. But for the most part, it really doesn't affect us that much. Today, today, there are people who their families had a funeral for them because they accepted Jesus Christ, because as far as their family is concerned, they are dead to them. They are cut off from inheritance. They are no longer wanted around their family. As far as those families are concerned, dead. In some countries, if it's found out that they're a follower of Jesus Christ, they have the ability of beatings and or death. They have opponents. 
And I realize that because we don't have that here, it's hard for us to comprehend the cost it would be. But let me tell you what I'm excited about. Somewhere on the face of this earth, there is a pastor in one of those countries that is preaching this morning out of Philippians chapter 1 and is telling them, don't worry about your opponents. And to them, it means everything. It doesn't have the weight to you, but it definitely has the weight to them because they're feeling it. Their business just went away or their friends won't talk to them or their life or their running because of their choice of Jesus Christ. And as we read it, we go, oh, yeah, the opponents, to them, this is truth. And not be frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them. What does this mean? Um, I'm fairly immature with my boys. They're getting more mature than me. What I love is when I was a kid, I would torture them and scare them and mess with them, right? I'd do something and I wanted the reaction out of them. They matured to the point now where they just roll their eyes and ignore me. Does that make sense? And I actually love that more. That they matured to the point that I can't get to them anymore. They're like, ah, dad, and they move on. Because what I want is I want a reaction. And they're like, whatever. Like, they don't even just, they don't even move. I want you to take that with this. These opponents are trying to frighten them, and they're going, okay. Don't you understand we could take your business? Um, God said that he'll take care of me. Don't you understand that we could, we could, we could take your stuff? Um, he said he'll clothe me and feed me. Um, do you understand we could put you in jail? I guess I'll have another group of people to share Jesus with then. See, whatever they're saying to them that's meant to frighten them, Paul's saying this. This is a clear sign to them. When they try to react, your opponents try to react, and you go, um, God's got this? So whatever plan you have, bring it on because I have a bigger God than whatever you think you have a plan with. That's a level of maturity. See, we worry. Oh, what are they going to say? Or what are they going to think? And what are they going to do? And what are they going to try? And what are they going to do? Okay. Say what you got to say. Say the things you're going to say about me. Okay. Don't you think that people are going to believe it? If they don't come talk to me, I guess they will. Okay. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. Here's what I love. There's story after story of people that have tried to oppress people, and because of their reaction of faith in Jesus Christ, they were so impressed by that reaction, they actually accepted Jesus Christ. Oh, I expect them to, they'll run in fear. They didn't run in fear. Why don't they run in fear? Oh, they have a trust in a God that's bigger than me. What about that God? And next thing you know, they're following Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. And that from God. Now, before I put it up on the screen, I'm going to tell you right now, none of us like verse 29. Don't look at don't no, don't read ahead. I saw all these heads go down to the foot. Don't do it. I'm going to tell you right now, every one of you in this room wants me to skip 29. You do. I'm not going to, but you want me to. Here we go. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. For it's been granted to you. That's like getting a gift. For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ. Now we're back to the apostles going, man, I was worthy to take a beating for him, for his name. For it's been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, woohoo, but also suffer for his sake. Oh. But I will tell you this, there is something in suffering in this lifetime, which by the way is called a vapor and a mist, that does something incredible for our eternity. 
I'm telling you, I could preach sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon, and I'm telling you, I don't know if it's as impactful as having somebody suffer for the name of Jesus Christ and give him glory. There's something powerful about someone who will stand under the heat of whatever it is and give praise to Jesus. It does something in our culture. It does something in our society. For the sake of Christ. That's the point. You don't suffer to suffer. You suffer for the sake of Christ. Not only to believe in him and suffer for his sake. And suffer for his sake. All right, we got one verse to go and you'll be done with chapter one. Here we go. Verse 30. Engaged in the same conflict you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So let me just tell you what he just said. It's absolutely profound. Okay, Philippi Church, how did your church start? Do you remember me being put into prison and beaten? Do you remember that? And from that scenario and my faithfulness to Christ of suffering that, you have a church. So he just said, let me give you the evidence. You don't have a church the way you have it if I didn't get beaten in Philippi, in the very city, by your leadership, beaten, and therefore won the jailer who began the church along with Lydia in Philippi. This is what he's saying. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, by the way, and now here that I still have. It should not be a surprise to you that I'm in jail in the city of Rome because God uses suffering to start amazing things, i.e. the church in Philippi. The church in Philippi started out of suffering, of Paul being beaten, and yet giving glory to God. And he's saying to the church in Philippi, and he's saying to you, Cedars Church, we should not be surprised. Not be surprised that God still uses suffering to plant amazing things in this world. The reality is most of us are not going to suffer. We're just not. Not the way this is. But if it comes... What are you going to do? And until it comes, are you living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? Because Paul's not going to come visit us the way he promised to visit the Philippian church. But he has left us words to say this. Live in a manner worthy. And by the way, if the suffering comes, step into it. And count yourself worthy of being beaten or suffering or whatever it is for the name of Jesus Christ. Because to his glory, great things come from those who will suffer and raise his name on high. And what's so funny is we see it in our society. There are people in our society, we watch them, they get everything and they have the company, they do everything else, and then we watch them have miserable lives. And yet there's hero after hero after hero who have suffered for Christ and transformed their village or their town or their school or their community or their office. And I'm praying that for us. I know you don't want me to, but I'm praying that for us. That we be willing to step into that place. Step into that place and say, God, if that's what you choose for me, I'm willing to do so. Now, I want you to know, again, this is a mature level that Paul has gotten to, and this is the goal, but I'm telling you, folks, can I encourage you, grind, grind, grind to get to that goal. That you could be a person that goes, live as Christ, die as gain. There's nothing here that's more important than being with Jesus Christ, but if he has me here, let me do everything I can to lift up his name. And with that thought, let me pray. Heavenly Father, let us not be ashamed let us not be ashamed of our actions. 
Let's not be ashamed because when someone asks us about Jesus, we change the subject. Let us not be ashamed because when someone heard that we were going to church and asked about it, we made nothing of it. Father, let us be all about the glory of what you're doing in our lives. Let us not be ashamed. And Father, if we're to face life or death, let us not be ashamed. However we face it, let us not be ashamed. For Father, you are worthy, worthy, worthy of our very lives. And let us give you the glory that you are due. The glory that you are due. Father, I just want to thank you and bless you and ask that you would just move in us in powerful ways. In Jesus' name, amen.